pray. Amen. So adversity comes in various forms in our lives, but I think everyone can agree that this guy in this story was having a bad day. Uh, listen to what he wrote on his accident report. When I got to the building, I found the hurricane and knocked off some bricks around the top. So I rigged up a beam with a pulley at the top of the building and hoisted up a couple of built barrels full of bricks. When I fixed the damaged area, there was a lot of bricks left over. And then I went to the bottom and began releasing the line. And fortunately, the barrel of bricks was much heavier than I was. And before I knew it, I was... Um, before I knew what was happening, the barrels started coming down, jerking me up. I decided to hang on since I was too far off the ground by then to jump. And halfway up, I met the barrel of bricks coming down fast. I received a hard blow on my shoulder. I then continued to the top, banging my head against the beam and getting my fingers pinched the jam and jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground hard, it burst open its bottom, hole, uh, and the br bricks fell out. I was now heavier than the barrel, so I started down again at a high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up fast and received severe injuries to my shins. When it hit the ground, it landed on the pile of spilled bricks, getting several painful cuts and deep bruises. At this point, I must have lost my presence of mind because I let go of the grip on the line. The barrel came down fast, gave me another blow on my head, and put me in the hospital. I respectfully request sick leave. <laughs> so, again, a bad day, but really, regardless of what form adversity takes in our lives, God has a provision for it. And we see some of those in Romans chapter 8 as we turn there to really work through this really wonderful passage in terms of just all it reveals about who God is and what he's provided for us. I mean, clearly Paul is wrapping up a section here, bringing it to a conclusion, really a, a crescendo, if you will, in terms of a music, a, rou a rousing conclusion. I mean, basically what we have seen thus far in terms of just the principles that are shared, just from verses 28 on to where we are in 34, we see in the first slide, again, the, the, the first uh, provisions here, is that God works in our circumstances, working, them, working to get them together for the good. That's in verse 28. God chose us and predestined a plan for us to come to Jesus and to be part of his family in verse 29. God is for us as opposed to being against us, in verse 31, and God gives assurance in the presence of accusation, regardless of the source. And that is really what we, where we left ourselves uh, when I, we were here last in the book of Romans chapter 8. And I certainly want to give a shout out to Spencer, naturally, uh, for covering for me last week. But uh, just to read uh, from particularly verse 31 here, and to get this cadence that Paul is setting up, I think to enhance the message that he's presenting, the truth that he wants us to be aware of, he is doing this question and answer. Kind of this question that he asks um, that, that uh, is like an answer is pretty obvious, that we know the obvious in God's economy is going to be a good answer. But rather than just giving the answer, he asks the question to really stir up our minds and cause us to think more deeply about what the answer should be. So, in verse 31, he says this, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring it any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us? And so again, that's where we left last week, and what we see in terms of really the significance of verse 34 is just the importance of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we recognize the, 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 the ultimate provision that was there, that, that one with the other, out the other really doesn't make sense or it, it, it's really not useful to us. If Jesus were simply to die for our sin and remain dead, then he would not have the victory that he would need to provide for us to overcome sin and provide salvation. But he was, if he was just raised from the dead and didn't purchase our salvation by dying, then his resurrection wouldn't matter. So it's that hand in glove in terms of just the necessity of both of those things. And even to see here in verse 34, the fact that like as he's raised, 
the knowledge we have is that he's interceding for us. That, that basically his work has not finished. You know, his life here on earth clearly showed that Jesus was working on behalf of humankind. That he was here to reveal the person of God, the provision of God, the purpose of God. And so therefore, when we recognize that now when he's raised, he is now in heaven and he's interceding for us. Particularly in light of the condemnation that we would tend to be under. When we recognize that Satan is also there, up there in the court of heaven, and is bringing accusation against us. He's giving God all the reasons why God shouldn't love us, and shouldn't be for us, and shouldn't accept us. And Jesus is right there defending us. So a great picture of, again, the provision that God makes for us in the heavenlies. But what's interesting about how 35 flows from 34 is that but Jesus does not, does not only take care of what is happening in heaven, but he also has a persevering love that follows us here on earth. So not only he taking care, and this is naturally for believers in Jesus, this is not for everyone, Those are the, this is for people that are connected to him. Again, he's taking care of what's opposing us in heaven, but in addition to that, he also has this persevering love that follows us here on the earth. So what you see in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Again, a, a question that Paul answers to maintain this cadence, but then answering it, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We, cons we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so basically, you know, maybe the question we'd ask in terms of verse 35 is how much of your life can be pressed in there? You know, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I mean, basically, you know, the, the, the main context that, uh, well, the folks here, as I said in, in, on the slide, the focus here is what is suffered in persecution. Not that, that it doesn't apply, apply to other circumstances as well. But it's in persecution that the rejection of others is most felt and where the love of God is most valued. So again, when we look at these dynamics of the description of life, the thing, again, the tragedies, the adversity we might come against, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, can that separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is absolutely not. Of course it can't. And yet when we think about Paul's life, when we think about what believers faced in the first century, I think even when we think about the persecuted church around the world, as, as they're suffering persecution, that they're going through the very things that Paul is describing. Maybe if we are in situations where we are facing things that are similar, or maybe we as Americans can imagine 5, 10, 15 years from now, we might be facing these things where all of a sudden, being aligned with Jesus means physical harm, physical danger, physical uh, difficulties that we have to go through in terms of what's described. And, and that's where uh, Paul is affirming to us as believers that even though in that we're suffering the rejection of people, that we have the love of Christ. And so that becomes a, a, a defense. That becomes something to hold on to in the presence of the rejection of men. Or people, and what I mean when I say men. What's interesting to me <clears throat> at the beginning of 35 is he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he says, Shall trouble or hardship, so on and so forth. So he starts off with a who, but then describes a what. Do you see that? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship? See, the who is a person, the what is the persecution and the hardship. And so therefore, what I think Paul is saying there is his focus, talking about the what, is the who that's perpetrating the what. It's, it's the persecutors. In other words, it, he, he's not just fo focusing on the hardship or the suffering, he's focusing on the people that are doing it. And so therefore, as again, as human beings are reflecting their disfavor, their dislike, their hatred, their punishment, their disregard for us. What do we cling to? We cling to the love of Christ. Because nothing we face in terms of people's opinion, their attitude, their actions, their speech, 
can ever compromise who we are and what we are in Jesus Christ. That again, as we persevere through the difficulties of life, God's love perseveres with us. And so even though I think that the focus that Paul has here are on principles that come in persecution, I don't think that you know, anything that would happen that's not about persecution, again, you have a bad day, you're, you're, you're suffering loss, or you're suffering pain, or whatever, it, it's still a principle, it's still a passage to turn to, to recognize that nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, and how significant that is in terms of just all, all that God would seek to affirm in terms of affirming his love for us. Now, it's interesting in terms of the quote that is here in verse 36, because again, he moves right from, uh, you know, again, talking about Jesus in heaven, all the work he's doing there, and saying, okay, Jesus is not just taking care of heaven, he's taking care of you here on this earth, and maybe the, the, the circumstance that we would most, most need taken care of is that we're going through hard things, well, Jesus is there as well, and then verse 35, I'm sorry, verse 36 quotes Psalm 24, 22 um, in terms of just, uh, just, at, just reflecting back, I'm sorry, 44, 22, reflecting back on an Old Testament scripture that would mo most often be used by those suffering persecution. And when you read here in verse 30, for your sakes we face death, all day long, we considered a sheep to be slaughtered. You know, again, I don't know to what extent you might feel that way, you might think that way. You know, for some of us, uh, you know, as we do represent the gospel, as we do take a stand for Jesus, you know, the pressure that we receive, the disregard we receive, maybe the rejection that we receive from family, there's a lot of different things that can happen. And sometimes you feel, you know, something... For God's sake, I face death all day long. I'm always dying to myself. I'm always have to remind myself, yes, love your enemies, do good for those who despitefully use you, love those who persecute you. Again, that's like dying to yourself. It's not going in rage and anger and vengeance. It's, it's, it's again, loving in spite of what people deserve, forgiving in spite of what people deserve. I mean, that's dying to yourself. That, that's giving yourself over to death uh, and being a sheep to the slaughter. But then extrapolate that to the, the greater danger, the greater persecution that people are suffering today. Placed in prison, beaten, killed, you know, your, your life being on the line. You know, that, that's certainly the context that Paul is speaking into as he's writing to the Romans. You know, at this point in time that when Paul is writing, Christianity is not a popular thing. You know, there's various, various stages of persecution that happen in Roman history uh, toward the church. And so Paul, basically ministering the love of Christ in the presence of that, to recognize that again, in spite of what they might be suffering at the hands of people, that, that God is still with them. See, basically to know that, uh, that, that love, when, when, when God talks about love, love is about personhood it's not about performance. You know, it's, it's, it's that love that, that Paul is affirming and we need to cling to in terms of what we receive knowing that God loves us. To know that God is committed to us, cares for us, and values us, again, is especially important when life seems to be telling us just the opposite. And so now in verse 37... Uh, you know, again, as he's flowing from, from all these thoughts, all these principles of what God is doing, what, God, what, what Christ has provided for his people, uh, and, you know, like particularly in light of, hey, do you feel like you're pressed in? Do you feel like you're a sheep to the slaughter? Do you feel like you're, you're being defeated, that, that, that evil is winning? That, 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 that you're not being successful in terms of what you're doing. Then in verse 37, this is where he flows for this great statement. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so again, in, 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 this, um, in this cadence, in this crescendo, 
in this resolving and coming to bringing this passage to the, to the conclusion. Again, this is a high point in terms of what he's saying. You know, when we think about all the things that he has described in terms of what God has provided for us, who Jesus is, what he's doing on our behalf, how we then engage with a world that is opposed to us. We engage with a soul that sometimes is opposed to us. Sometimes we, well, we always engage with a sin nature that is opposed to us. So in the midst of all that, the midst of all the battle, in the midst of all the opposition, what does Jesus firmly say? We are more than conquerors. That's what God has made us. More than conquerors. Now I'm not sure, you know, well, I mean, the first thing to think about is all these things. That's all the things, you know, that, you know, when you read the list in 35, trouble, hardships, persecution, famine, you know, you're feeling yourself kind of going down, hardships, persecution, famine, like, 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 which of us would just automatically, by virtue of going through those things, say, yeah, I must be a conqueror in that, right? No, those are things that weigh us down, but then in all those things, all those things, you know, you I think God is the only one that can get away with all. He, he's the only one that can get away with all and never. Don't you remember that? You know, when you're going through life and you're going through school, never use all, never use never. You really can't say all and never. Because, again, we don't know. But God knows. And God knows that it's all. And all these things, all the tragedy, all the troubles, all the suffering, all the persecution, God's banner over that is more than conquerors. That's who we've been made in Christ Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me that it's more than conquerors and not just conquerors. You know, why? It, would, it would be fitting. It would be encouraging. We would still be uplifted. I'd still be excited if Paul said, and no, we're conquerors in, over these things. That would be good, right? But I almost imagine Paul writing, and he's saying, okay, you no, know, and on all these things, we are conquerors through him who loved us. Boy, that just doesn't quite make it. Conquerors isn't enough. God is too great. He has provided too much. We are set up too much powerfully in terms of all that God has provided to say, no, it's just, you're not just conquerors, you're more than conquerors. See, that's an interesting way for us to speak. I mean, it's not like we don't, we don't speak that way sometimes. Oh, can I handle this? Oh, you can more than handle it. Right? We say that. But what are we expressing when we're saying those words? We're expressing it overconfidence because it's so obvious. It's, it's just such a natural conclusion. And to realize that over our lives is the natural conclusion that you are more than a conqueror. Now some of you may hear those words and you might turn around and say, who's he talking about? Can't be me. God, God can't talk about me being more than a conqueror. Well, let me tell you this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then these words define you. It is what God has declared. It is what God has enabled for you to be. You know, I, 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 I wonder about really the desire that we have to be victorious in our lives. You know, when you think about that principle of victory, of conquering, you know, I think that's a pretty prevalent desire in our lives. Maybe, I mean, I may be speaking as a man here, so maybe this is a more a man thing than a woman thing, uh, but, you know, when you think about people, and I hope this works for you, because this really, you know, enlightened it to me, but anyway, when you think about people's allegiance to sports teams, being a fan of a sports team, I mean, have you ever been in a situation where your sports team wins and you feel like you won something because they won? Or when they lose, you feel like you've lost something? Like it's some commentary on me when the Green Bay Packers lose. <laughs> like, like how strange a dynamic is that? Or you know, you see my Patriots, they beat them and look at how they pass and Tom Brady did this. And, well, what did you do when I sat and I watched on TV? <laughs> like what? And yet, isn't there a strange thing that we do that their victory is our victory? And then go from there to think about video games. 
Think about what we convince ourselves of when we play video games of what we're accomplishing, what victory comes out. I've got my World of Warcraft or my body of honor, I don't even know the one, but I know my Assassin's Creed or whatever, and I conquered this territory and my military beat those guys down. You realize you're sitting in a chair in your <laughs> living room, right? Like you realize you're, you're not, yeah, I mean, not there's not skill, you know, they have the video game Olympics, maybe there's a place to do that, but they are expressing the very thing that I think God has placed in our hearts. But the reality is, forget about the video game, forget about the sports teams, you're a conqueror in and of yourself. Amen. That, 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 and this battle is real. The enemy that we face is real. And to recognize that God gives you the victory. So forget about conquering territory or being a fan of the, how about being a fan of Jesus? How about being proud of Jesus and his kingdom and a win for Jesus is a win for me? That what I'm most concerned about is what victory am I accomplishing for the sake of him? And to know that God has just greased the wheel, has set us up to say, you're more than a conqueror. You can do this. Right, like, I'm not sure God, yeah, you can, like, like, like if you ever go to God and say, God, I'm not sure that I can quite do this. God will always say, yes, you can. If I've willed it, if I've directed it, then yes, you can. Well, why, God? Because I've made you more than a conqueror. That he's enabled you to perform his will. And so, therefore, if God has declared you more than a conqueror, and you're not a conqueror, where's the problem? Can't be in what God has done, right? Oh, God, you just didn't, like, give me the power I needed. You just, you know, what? not enough wisdom. It's us that we're lacking faith. We're lacking fit. Well, we're lacking will. We're lacking engagement in terms of the word and the spirit and prayer and fellowship and all the things that God gives us to build up his life in us. But if we do that, we will be able to embrace and apply the conquering that Jesus gives. You know, when you think about just all the places in our lives where we need victory. You know, I, I, mean, the, what, I mean, when we talk about in this victory, God takes care of the inside and the outside. Like, I think there's a lot of victory that we need to accomplish in our own heads. I think this soul needs to be conquered. Would you say that about your soul too? That this soul, soul the, the thoughts I think, the things I say, the things I do, the things I desire, guess what? There's a bunch of conquering that needs to happen right there. And so therefore, we understand what, what God means when he talks about being more than a conqueror. It's not necessarily beating up unbelievers. It's not taking care of evil people. I think he does that when it's appropriate, but I think that's his purview. Again, we remember, we say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He will repay. That basically our conquering is to love our enemies. And so therefore, I overcome my vengeance. I overcome my anger. I overcome the evil that I might uh, be tempted to fall into in the presence of evil coming at me. That's a conquering I do. But then we can be confident that if there is a conquering that needs to happen in circumstance, again, we face that disappointment where, oh, the mission trip isn't happening. Or, oh, I'm sick and I can't do this. Or, oh, you know, this, um, this that, 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 that I conquer my thoughts. I, I, I maintain the peace and the joy that God would have me have. I, I maintain the witness in terms of what, what I would represent in Christ. And then I trust God to take care of the circumstances as he sees fit and when he sees fit. But in my hope and my expectation, I'm a conqueror. That if I'm in circumstances, I feel, boy, this really should change. Guess what? I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror to persevere while God is developing the answer. And then when God develops the answer, I join in his conquering, and then we got it. It's, it's, it's internal meets external, and now the victory is won. And that's how the Christian life works. 
That, that's again the dynamic, that's the banner, that's the understanding, the principle that God would have us understand about just who we are. See, no, in all these things we were more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know, I think the greatest thing that God provides, what he promises is his presence, and what he most secures us is in is with his love. Like that? What he most promises is his presence, what he most secures us with is his love. See, it's interesting to me, and again, this might be a man thing too, if you call me more than a conqueror, I'm expecting you to talk about power, <clears throat> strength, ability, right? I can win this, I can be a conqueror, but he doesn't go, he's not talking about love. What it's like, this is like watching a romantic movie. You know, one of those girl movies that, that you know, your wife wants to watch and you don't? Like, what? They're talking? And they're, they're like, having, they're, well, where's the fight scene? When, when's the car wreck? You, know, you don't get a car wreck in, in Romans 8. No, now he says, I make you a conqueror through my love. That love is the thing that sustains. Love is the thing that, behold, that holds and grasps and, and comforts in terms of what God provides. And so, just, so therefore, now again, all these verses just kind of flow, again, in, in this whole uh, crescendo of, of music in terms of principles of theology, of, of, of provision in what God has done. And so now, so, so again, from 37, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Well, what does that love look like? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If you're ever looking for a place of encouragement in the Bible... Turn to Romans 8, 28, and then you can even almost skip the verses to 38, 39. Uh, but in terms, you remember that list that I had at the beginning? All the things that God has done for us and provided? The way that Paul is, again, setting up this crescendo in terms of ending this section of the book of Romans? And what better way to do it, what better principle to reinforce than the fact that God loves you? Because you know something? You can do a lot of stuff. You can accomplish a lot of things, and if you don't have love, it's pretty empty. It's pretty empty in terms of how we, in the depth of our personhood, want to know that we're loved. We want to know that we're accepted. We want to know that we're okay. See, again, love is about personhood. It is about God saying, I have affection for you because of who you are. I desire you because of who you are. That I love you and think special things about you because of who you are. Now, it, is, it flows from who he is naturally, but it's God's unconditional love that is being pointed here. And what I like about 30 and 39 is it's almost like Paul is reaching, like, 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 like what, what can I describe that describes every single aspect of life and recognize that really nothing separates us from the love of God? Because really he could just say, for I'm convinced that nothing separates us from the love of God. And just end it, right? Okay, it's nothing, well, when, but when you hear the words life or death, well, what, what aspects of your life are about life and death? It's really everything, right? Well, maybe the maybe time, maybe the present and the future could separate me from that. No? Maybe, maybe evil forces and powers beyond God. No, no. Maybe something that's high or low. Maybe something in creation could separate me from the love. No. Can't separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. See, it's not like bad things won't happen, but God does not free us. I mean, God does not free us from that hardship or tragedy, but he does assure us of his presence with us, but not only his presence, but his love for us. You know, what I want you to, what I want you to think about is that time when love was new, like, like the first time she said yes, 
like you, 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 you sweat bullets. I'm going to ask her out. This isn't even on, just, you know, I'm going to ask her out. Is she going to say yes? Or, oh, is he going to ask me out? And then she does. And you don't care what happened, right? You remember that day? Remember that day when you had your first date with someone you really wanted to, and once she said yes, nothing else mattered, right? You, know, you fail a test, someone hits my car, you know, whatever, you lose my job. Doesn't matter, she said yes, going on a date on Friday night. Or maybe, 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 she, maybe we could extrapolate to marriage, and when she says yes, I mean, I'm going to connect my life with you. Um, that's a blessing in and of itself. But, and she, like, that's, that aspect of love is what God's love means to be with us. That, that's what Paul is expressing here. That, that, that once you understand the power of love to control, to dictate, to, to, to embrace, to, to, to uh, just overwhelm, and you see that on an earthly plane, how much more so to say, I can never be separated from God's love. And letting that love envelop us. Let that love affirm us. Let that love, as I'm being a conqueror, as I'm living for Jesus, as I'm suffering for, 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 for persecution, that that love makes me more than a conqueror. That love allows me to control my soul. That love allows me to treat people in the way that God would have me treat them in spite of what I would normally do. And, and, and that's, that's the crescendo of what Paul is presenting. Now, I did have a sense that this uh, passage would, would, would flow very well into communion. And when we think about just the love of God expressed through communion, and whatever those serving would want to do as far as washing their hands or whatever in terms of health concerns, go and do that. But to... to, to to recognize that the, the, the greatest expression of love that God made to us is by providing Jesus Christ on the cross. And it is through, like, recognize that even as, as 39 ends, uh, let me read the both because it, it shows just so, from convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor the height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And again, that's where it's found. That's where it was expressed. That, that's where it even, is even directed to. I mean, God in another passage of Scripture talks about how He loves the world. This passage of Scripture talks about how God loves believers. How God loves people that have chosen to connect themselves to Jesus Christ through faith. And if that describes you, then this is an exciting day. You, you have an exciting life. You, you, you have a guarded, protected, cared for, valued life before God that this passage defines. That you can believe, you can grasp hold of, you, you can let it be the thing that, that transforms and changes you because I really do believe that the song that Mike is going to come and sing really describes what our lives are because of Jesus Christ.